Am petu ash de midaki api. A champi we imachi api lena shitanko lakota imata ha chante wash de nape chayuzapo. Uh, good day, relatives. I'm Cheryl Crazy Bull, President and CEO of the American Indian College Fund. I just shared my Lakota name is Wachiapiwi, which means they depend on her. I'm a citizen of the Shichangu Lakota uh, Nation, the Shichangu Lakota Oyate. Um, we're currently located on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Central South Dakota. And I greet all of you with a good heart and a handshake. You know, these are very troubling times for us. And as we begin our discussion today, um, that's part of our Indigenous Activism Speaker Series, I just wanna take a moment for us to kind of ground ourselves in our relationship with the Creator. Um, however we see and experience that relationship is real important to us. Um, many people throughout um, the world really are um, living in very difficult circumstances, very difficult environments, everything from, you know, violence to poverty to, um, you know, the challenges that uh, COVID-19 has brought. And in particular, you know, in our communities, the challenges around racial and social justice. And so the creator gives us strength. The creator gives us the um, clear mind that we need and the strong heart that we need for this work. So I just I always like to open these by taking a moment to just call us to that place of being present in our relationship with the creator and thinking of our relatives who aren't able to be with us um, or our relatives who you know just need our help. They just need our prayers and our support. Um, so the College Fund, uh, we decided that we would do this Indigenous Activism Speaker Series because we issued a call, a solidarity statement when the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, really um, exploded in its response in recent months to the racial issues that the racism that's going on in the country and particularly the violence against people of color. And I and I didn't want that uh, solidarity to be just about us um, uh, making a statement. I wanted us to take some action. So among the things that we decided to do um, was this indigenous uh, activism series, particularly directed at students. So we tape the series and uh, we make it available on our YouTube channel so that it's more widely um, dispersed and shared um, among the populations that we serve. Um, I think that there's uh, great opportunities for Native students in particular. And so the College Fund, you know, that's our constituency that we most focus on is how to help them have a good experience with higher education so that they can have more um, of an impact in their with their families and their communities and in their own quality of life. So today we're having the fifth in our seventh series. I just want to mention also that our other series are um, available on our YouTube channel and you can also learn about the two upcoming series by visiting our uh, website at collegefund.org under our advocacy page. And our next two will be a discussion about um, what does it mean to invest or divest in the police and law enforcement and uh, another one on representation uh, and um, you know, continued work that we have to do around mascot issues. So today's webinar topic is fighting oppression through direct action and living a life of joy. Um, our guests are uh, Matt Remley and Jalene Joseph and I'm really happy to bring these two things together because I think that uh, it's hard to live a life of joy with everything that's going on, but it is an act of um, fighting oppression when you live a life of joy. So Jalene will be sharing um, with us today to talking about that. And then Matt, who has been, um, is not only an educator, but is a direct activist. I wanted him to share that experience and um, I feel like these two things are, you know, two sides of one coin. And it's just really great to be able to do that. So I'm going to introduce Matt first and then uh, introduce Jaleen. And then after I've done with the introductions, then Jaleen will give her presentation followed by Matt. And then um, I encourage participants to send uh, any questions that they have in the chat, kind of depending on how timing goes as to whether or not we'll have a lot of time for Q&A at the end. Um, I really offer that flexibility to our presenters that they can 
you know, talk as much as they need to to get their message across. And then they can also respond to the chat. And if we have time, I also um, offer questions. So Matt is a Hukpapa Lakota. Uh, he currently lives in the Duwamish territory uh, near Seattle, Washington with his family. Um, I actually know where that's at. So since I lived up in the Northwest for, for 10 years myself, um, he's the editor and writer for Last Real Indians, which if you haven't, um, you know, been on Last Real Indians, I encourage you to do so. It's a very uh, informative and provocative site. He works for the Office of Native Education for the Marysville School District. So Matt has had some important direct action work that um, really is part of what made me aware of him and, and what he does. So he authored Seattle's Indigenous Peoples Day resolution, which um, called for the city called for Congress to engage in reconciliation with tribes over the boarding school era policies. Um, he authored and worked with Seattle's resolution to oppose the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline and the ordinance to divest from Wells Fargo. And this has been really an area where I've seen Matt's uh, activism just really take hold, being part of the um, taking over the banking system by helping. Um, establish a public bank in, in Seattle and looking uh, and working with the Green New Deal Steering Committee because those things are all closely tied together. He's a co-founder of uh, Maza Scott Talks, which is a global divestment initiative, um, working on helping corporations and banks, um, you know, divest from things that impact social welfare and the environment. He's had several awards and I'm just going to mention a couple of them. Um, the National Indian Education Association Educator of the Year, the Billy Frank Natural Resource Protection Award, which I think is a credible honor, Billy Frank being one of our heroes, and named um, as one of, by the Seattle Times as one of the top 10 influential people to watch. Um, so I think that that's really an honor as well. I think of my, um, one of my uncles who said, uh, you know, you don't have to talk about yourself because the people can see you. And that's what happens for you, Matt. So thank you. Um, Jalene, of course, is um, also our other panelist. She's an enrolled citizen of the Grovan or Ahane uh, people from Fort Belknap, Montana, currently living in Oregon with her life partner and children. So Jalene is the executive director of the Native Wellness Institute, which is a national nonprofit that does incredible work helping us to be well as Indigenous peoples. She has a bachelor's degree in community health and has just worked in any country in um, many capacities around our wellness and our healing. Um, she's traveled all over. People know her everywhere. Um, and she's been really uh, giving of her heart and her life to this work um, around our wellness. Um, she does a lot of work to provide um, support all across the spectrum too. And particularly, I appreciate the ways that she's actually worked with the college fund on some of our wellness in the workplace initiatives right now. And, uh, she enjoys, uh, which I think is part of the joy of living. She enjoys beating, reading, powwowing, and spending time with family and friends. So please join me in welcoming Matt and Jalene, and Jalene will speak first. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to be here. I'm super excited. I've been looking forward to this um for all month actually and i woke up early just laying in bed thinking about this morning so thanks again for having me um so what i want to talk about you know i love this title fighting oppression through direct action and living a life of joy like all those words are just like powerful words in of themselves and so the approach that i want to take for um activism is really starting like within and so, and, and Matt's gonna follow up, you know, looking at other things that we can do. So when we look at um, direct action, you know, I wanna encourage and challenge people to like, to look inward. So right now we're in a, you know, we're in a, in a, in a pandemic, we're also in a revolution. And when we look at that word revolution and we break it down and we look at the, you know, the, the history of that word, it's really talking about turning turning things around that's what that's what revolution means right and so when we look at doing our own personal revolution um, to me that's where it needs to start and so for example 
the work that we do at the Native Wellness Institute, we exist because of the lasting impacts of historical and intergenerational trauma. And what that has contributed to is um, all kinds of things that we find in our tribal and our urban and our rural communities, right? The, um, the poverty and the violence and you know all of, all of that kind of stuff. And so we exist more importantly to provide opportunities for healing because we know healing is the answer to trauma. So when I talk about a personal revolution with our own selves, I'm really talking about our our personal healing journeys right so so taking that look within um and seeing what we can do for our own selves to to heal and so um when we do that you know what my mentors have taught me is that the longest journey that we'll ever take is from like here i'm pointing to the top of my head if you're not watching the screen to here and now i'm like pointing to my heart so the longest journey we'll take is from here to here and then when we go through our healing journey, really what we're doing is we're taking that journey back from our hearts and back to our head. So when we learn these new skills and we learn these new tools to help us move forward in a good way, then we have to put them into action here, right? Um, so I just wanted to share a few tips and um, some tools like to help us do that. So then we can live a life of joy. And so, I always use um, my bag as an example. So I'm holding up this my this is my work bag and it's filled with all my, you know, notepads and books and things like that. So what this bag represents is like the baggage that that we carry, right? And we can think about all the stuff that we carry in our bag. And we even hear people say like, oh, they have a lot of baggage or oh, they have a lot of issues, right? Well, that baggage and the issues that we're talking about is like all that unresolved stuff that we hold on to, whether it's um, grief, whether it's guilt, whether it's shame, whether it's abandonment, you know, all those kinds of things that we hold on to, sometimes from our childhood, sometimes we pack around our parents' stuff or our grandparents' stuff or our ancestors' stuff. And then when things happen in life, like, like we're, we're triggered or we add more stuff to our bags and we're packing it around on this side and we're packing it around on this side and it makes us tired, like, like we're, we're tired. And even this pandemic right now has been very triggering for so many of our people. And I talked to an elder in Michigan and every day she goes by the cemetery where her people are buried that died from the smallpox. And what she realized was this pandemic was triggering all these emotions that she thought she worked through already. And so she actually went out there and like made peace with that so she could let go of the anger and all of that stuff that she was holding on to so that she could better work to protect herself and her family during this pandemic. So that was, that was her like taking a look in her bag and seeing what she was holding on to. So when we do that, um, and we do some intentional healing around that we can let go of things in our bags and we can we can downsize to a smaller bag right like we don't have to be perfect and get rid of everything because that's you know kind of impossible but we can at least downsize and when we downsize by working on our healing and letting go of some of that stuff that we hold on to then we're going to create space for things like joy things like love, things like compassion. And when we do that, then we're going to bring more joy into our life. We're also going to make more space um, that helps us to like cope and deal with things like the pandemic or like the revolution that, that we're in. And so today I specifically wore my shirt that says grandma up so we have a series of different shirts and the the grandma up i am a grandma um but what the grandma up one also represents is that sometimes we just have to garner that inner strength and support that our grandmas had right that our grandmas could do anything and did everything and they and the one thing um i think that all grandmas continue to do is moving forward right and so when we do that internal uh revolution in, in looking at healing our own selves, what happens is that 
when people work on their own healing, they're gonna they're gonna automatically and genuinely look to uplift others because we know how powerful we feel and how amazing we feel and we want that for other people. So we're gonna automatically continue to lift other people up. And then so our revolution starts to expand, right? And it's like the 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 rock that we throw into the water and the ripples that go out, we become that rock into our our families and into our communities and into our nations and you know into into the whole country is that 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 ripple goes out and we help to lift other people up and so the the last thing that i want to share and, and i'll pass off the the time to matt is that when when we let go of the things that often hold us back and then we intentionally serve to fill that up with good stuff. That is a critical piece in our healing. Because if we don't fill ourselves back up with good things, like the joy and the happiness and all of that, then we're going to continue to like pick up the stuff that doesn't serve us in a good way. And so when we let go, we have to fill it up with good things. When we let go, we have to fill it up with good things. And we can we do that in a variety of ways, right? Positive self-talk, as an example. We do that by surrounding ourselves with positive, constructive people that are gonna, that when we get together, we're gonna talk about ideas and projects and things like that and not get together just to talk about other people, as an example. So we have to fill that back up um with with positive things so giving ourselves positive affirmations and you know watching and reading you know positive things and and things like that so those are some of the tools and then i guess there is one more last thing um bringing joy into our life um and choosing to be happy like starts with the decision to do that like this is how powerful how powerful we are as individuals is it is our minds are so powerful it's like yeah i want more happiness in my life like that's that's the first thing to think about like do i have happiness in my life do i have joy in my life if not why and if not how like how can i right so deciding that so if you don't have joy and happiness in your life you can you can decide to have that in in your life so um I can go on and on <laughs> and on for days. Um, so I wanna be mindful of the time and I do, there's lots of resources. Um, back in March, the Native Wellness Institute, when the country started shutting down, we knew that this pandemic was going to be traumatizing for, for our people. So it was like an already traumatized people were gonna be re-traumatized with this pandemic and all the stuff that it was gonna bring so immediately we got together and we met and we brainstormed and we planned and we put together what we call our native wellness power hours and so on march 21st we started we are now in week 23 so we have we're nearing 150 power hours and we have all of them on our youtube channel the native wellness institute's youtube channel so there's tons of one hour workshops one hour cooking shows comedy shows poetry readings all concerts like all kinds of stuff is on there and it's exactly intended for your own personal revolution so it's really looking at your own personal healing and wellness journeys and there's tips and tools and strategies on all kinds of topics on there so go to our i encourage you to go to our youtube channel and check some of them out like as you're folding laundry or you know going for a walk like tune in and listen in um to get more strategies to help you move forward so it's awesome to be here today um if you have questions feel welcome to put them in the chat and we're going to have more q a at the end but i'm going to pass it over to my friend and colleague matt remley thank you Amataki api chante waste nape choose api wakiam wanatana machi api yam waslaha and mataham ate wayagi Charles Remley ina wayagi Don Harrison wana Seattle Elwati well hello everybody um, I'm very grateful and happy to be here um, uh, presenting um, alongside Jillian uh, who I want to uh, 
express a lot of gratitude towards. Uh, she's actually been uh, working with us along with her team uh, in my paid job up with the Marysville School District and Tulalip Tribes in our department of uh, Indian education. So uh, very honored to, to follow you and to share some space with you. Uh, my Lakota name is Wakia Wa'anatan, um, which translates to He Charges with Thunder. Uh, that's a family name that was passed down to me a number of uh, years ago. So I'm very honored uh, in, to, to carry that name. Uh, my parents are Charles Remley and Donna Jean Harrison. Uh, my mom uh, was born and raised in Standing Rock up in Fort Yates. Uh, my dad's non-native. Uh, I've spent most of my life growing up out here in the Northwest in the, the Seattle uh, Tulalip area. So kind of uh, my, my home, homelands out here. And uh, with good feelings in my heart, I extend a hand to each and every one of you. Uh, I'd like to thank Cheryl and Carrie for the uh, offer to come share here today and the American Indian College Fund for putting this uh, space together. Uh, I really liked hearing that introduction about moving beyond just uh, statements of solidarity um, with the Black Lives Matter and putting that kind of into to action. So um, I, I really like hearing that. And uh, that's something that I try to do in a lot of work that I'm involved with is moving beyond uh, words and into action. Um, so I too was very excited to, to hop on today. In fact, uh, so excited that uh, I didn't do the correct time conversion. I'm out here on Pacific time. I thought this was starting on Central Time, so I came on like an hour early, so I'm just kind of sitting here by myself, but uh, yeah, glad to be here today. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about direct action and community organizing, uh, stuff that I've been involved with over uh, the, the past uh, couple decades, actually, uh, tried to fight for uh, social, environmental, tribal justice, on uh, numerous fronts. Um, but before I get into that, there's actually something that was shared previously that um, I, I really liked. You know, Jillian talked about uh, healing and healing oneself. And when we engage in direct action, community organizing, that has to be kind of the, the, the central thing that we um, carry within ourselves is, um, you know, how to take care of ourselves because we go out and face. Uh, pretty traumatic uh, um, situations sometimes when we're in the streets or involved in uh, various actions it can be very stressful, it can be very intense, and and sadly sometimes pretty uh, violent as well. Um, so it, that healing and being centered in your uh, culture, being centered in your spirituality, you know, is something that we stress with uh, all folks that we work with. You know, it reminds me of you know in in uh, ceremony, you know, my family. You know, how, how they taught us was, um, say, when we go into that lodge, that first round, that's for you, for your healing, to let go of any anything that might be negative, uh, has attached itself to you, you know, to let that go. That way, <clears throat> once you let go of those things, then you can begin to, to pray for the people or to help the people. So that's something that um, we try to carry in our various works. With... Um, the, the organizing, you know, I really look at it from the more as the perspective of having different roles and responsibilities. Each one of us carries a different role and a different responsibility as it relates to uh, our own families, our communities, to Wunchi uh, Maka, our grandmother earth. We have uh, tribal responsibilities um, and, and roles that uh, we're to, to carry out. <clears throat> And these are our, our fulfillments, these things that we need to do uh, to uplift our, our communities. So uh, sometime when we're engaged in um, actions, it isn't because, you know, we, we, we necessarily want to, but we have a responsibility to, to do these things and are asked to be doing so by uh, our families. And I'll go into an example of that as it relates to uh, Dakota Access Pipeline in a, in a bit. Um, but I also look at uh, organizing the direct action as um, kind of like a toolbox. I like to refer to it as a, a toolbox. And inside that toolbox, 
we have numerous tools that we can take and utilize uh, for whatever uh, uh, goals you're trying to achieve, whatever uh, justice you're trying to achieve. One of those tools being uh, the healing, you know, one of those tools being a uh, ceremony, one of these tools being uh, direct action. Um, the other tools are, are education, you know, city hall, you know, there's very different ways, um, uh, tools that we can access to achieve change. And how I was taught was that, you know, no tool is better or more important than the other. They're all equally necessary to achieving the type of changes that we need to better our communities uh, and protect our, our homelands. Uh, the other thing I want to say with that, you know, some wisdom that one of my aunties passed down to me uh, a number of years ago was that, uh, you know, everybody has kind of their own areas of, of passion, you know, of issues that they're very passionate about. For some people, it might be education. Some people might be mascots. Some people protecting water, you know, protecting land, uh, reviving our languages and, and stuff like that. And what she shared with me is that they're all equally important. There's no one that's more important to the other. And um, whatever passion uh, someone's being driven by, it's our responsibility to uh, support them in whatever capacity that we can. Um, I share that simply because for folks who get involved in organizing, um, there's sometimes this kind of like uh, almost like shaming that takes place of, well, this issue is more important than this issue and, and stuff like that. And I would just say that's, you know, that's irrelevant. Whatever is, is someone's passion is what someone's passion is. And uh, in fact, that's what's, what, what makes us strong. You know, you got various people working on uh, different issues and by supporting and uplifting uh, one another, we can only make our, our communities and uh, stronger and hopefully achieve some sort of justice. Um, a few of the uh, issues I want to talk about that we've, I'm also a big believer in um, what we can do on a very local level uh, that can impact change on a broader scale. So uh, meaning like what can we do here in, in Seattle to address, say, like the Dakota Access Pipeline or the Keystone XL Pipeline, which aren't, you know, directly impacting uh, folks here in Seattle, but um, what can we do here that can, in, you know, have a, uh, an impact in hopefully stopping or preventing uh, things like that happening. So over the years, um, I've developed uh, quite a few relationships with folks in uh, like Seattle City Council in various positions, um, elected positions in the city to see how we can impact change. One of those, as Cheryl mentioned in the uh, intro, was around that Dakota Access Pipeline. And uh, Carrie, you can go ahead and uh, start the slideshow. So when, um, in, in kind of the summer of when the Dakota Access Pipeline was uh, getting going, you know, a lot of the actions were centered, I can go back to that first one, uh, were centered obviously in uh, Standing Rock. So we wanted to see what we could do um, here in Seattle to, to raise awareness to the issue and what we could do to fight against uh, that pipeline. So we started having actions here in the city. And when we found out that the city uh, did all its banking with Wells Fargo. We knew Wells Fargo was um, one of the major uh, bankers uh, uh, helping finance that pipeline. So we went to the city uh, and said, um, you know, we want you to uh, with pull your uh, multi-billion dollar a year contract with Wells Fargo because they're financing this pipeline that violates uh, treaty rights, tribal sovereignty, is impacting uh, water and stuff like that. So through a combination of direct actions like this, where we would, you know, go in and uh, take banks over and um, uh, then going into uh, City Hall, we were able to craft uh, legislation. You can go to the next slide uh, to get the city to uh, pull its funding um, out of uh, Wells Fargo, which then triggered a much broader somewhat unexpected uh, uh, kind of global movement that uh, myself and the person in the middle you see there, her name's uh, Rachel Heaton, 
from the Muckleshoot tribe, which is just uh, south of Seattle. Her and I co-founded the uh, Musiska Talks based on our work with the city uh, going after Wells Fargo. Uh, the response to that was folks around uh, the globe literally reaching out, wanting to know how they could run uh, similar campaigns in their communities for whatever issue that they might be addressing from coal mines to uh, uh, coal mining to fracking to pipelines and stuff like that. And so we um, formed Muzzaska Talks to be kind of like an, an outlet they could turn to for, for resources, for uh, sample ordinances. And uh, we, we assisted them with uh, developing various campaigns. Uh, what you're seeing here in this picture, this is uh, Seattle's financial uh, district in downtown Seattle. Um, and in working with a lot of partners throughout the, the globe, uh, we were able to zero in on the fact that JP Morgan Chase is the single largest financer of uh, fossil fuel projects uh, in the whole world. <laughs> Pretty much all the, the tar sands projects, all the fracking projects, coal mining, and stuff like that, uh, they're the major funder. So uh, we have um, many times taken to the streets uh, and taken over their, uh, right behind us is actually their Western region headquarters um, to draw attention to um, what Chase is doing and to, and to hopefully put pressure on them to uh, withdraw their, their financing of these various projects. Because these corporations, they don't have the, the funding uh, and ability to finance these uh, projects on their own. They got to go to banks to get that money. And you can go ahead to uh, the next slide. Um, one of the er, uh, projects we took on right after the divestment from Wells Fargo and the, uh, the city is the Treaty Alliance Against Tar Sands Expansion, uh, which is kind of a coalition of, I believe it's like around 150 First Nations and tribes who uh, signed a treaty a number of years ago amongst each other to fight uh, the several proposed uh, tar sands expansion pipelines. Uh, and we were called and asked if we could bring in kind of that divestment angle, who the banks uh, financing those pipelines are, who the insurance companies are and stuff like that. And so uh, this is some uh, uh, cool artwork we had to, to launch uh, by Jackie Fawn to launch that particular campaign. We can go to uh, the next one. And so um, partly this is uh, inside of Seattle City Hall. Um, so partly what I wanted to show is, you know, we, we take a, a variety of actions. You know, it's not enough to just take over banks and be in the streets and do direct action. You, you have to have some uh, involvement with whomever your, your decision makers are on the particular issue that you're uh, working on. Uh, this actually was when, uh, right after Seattle City Council voted to uh, divest from Wells Fargo, and it was like a $28 billion contract they had with uh, Wells Fargo. So we bring our, um, uh, we, we actually bring in, a, sang an honor song, you know, because uh, we don't want to be adversaries with decision makers. We want to build uh, strong relationships. And so when they make the right decisions, you know, we want to bring, um, kind of that good heart in and uh, share that medicine with them. Uh, next, go ahead, next picture. Uh, fast forward a, a couple, uh, you know, a few years um, after developing some really strong relationships with the, the city, uh, we were seeing what the, um, was happening on the national level with the Green New Deal and that it was kind of stalling, you know, uh, 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 expectedly uh, with a divided, uh, uh, Congress. And so we wanted to see like, you know, we, could we do something here in Seattle that's even stronger than uh, the federal Green New Deal uh, in that we want to include uh, and make tribes uh, central to uh, the Green New Deal, as well as uh, the kind of the issue of environmental racism in um, communities of color who are most impacted by uh, uh, fossil, the fossil fuel industry. So uh, several of us got together and launched uh, Seattle for a Green New Deal, um, which centers all of those voices. Uh, this was from the launch of that uh, campaign, which was a little over a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, we set a goal of making Seattle be fossil fuel free by uh, 2030. 
this was also the same day we announced in working with our Seattle's attorney general to file a lawsuit against the uh, oil companies for their knowledge of the impact that burning fossil fuels would have on our environment. And uh, so we announced that uh, this day as well. You can hit the next one. Um, this is uh, sitting with our, our council members uh, to uh, push for the Green New Deal. Um, and again, you know, what I'm trying to show is, you know, you got to wear kind of multiple hats from uh, do, doing the kind of street direct action to uh, building partners and relationships with your elected folks. I don't know what the heck I was thinking of in this picture, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, learning that language and, and, and going in and, and doing your testimony, you know, and being having a literal seat at the table. Uh, we were very um, deliberate when we launched Seattle for a Green New Deal that the folks sitting at the table should be the folks who are most impacted by uh, the climate crisis. So this is uh, some of us uh, at that table pushing for Green New Deal. Go ahead to the next one. Um, following the passage of uh, the Green New Deal, we, we with the Seattle City Council, we worked with our King County Council. King County is where uh, Seattle and kind of our, I think there's uh, our largest uh, uh, population was resides within uh, King County. So we worked with some of the same folks um, that we did with Green New Deal, as well as uh, uh, other partners with universities and kind of the rural communities in uh, King County to launch uh, a, another campaign, which was to um, uh, ban any new fossil fuel project from coming into King County, um, whether it's pipeline, an export terminal, um, and, and stuff like that. Uh, for folks who don't know, Washington State is kind of like a, a one of the uh, ground zeros for the, the fossil fuel industry, being that we're a major port, um, or we have several major ports in Washington. And so there are numerous uh, uh, fossil fuel projects slated for the Northwest. So our idea was instead of waiting for um, a, a pipeline or a, a terminal to be uh, proposed and then we fight it, like, let's be proactive. What can we do to stop these projects from happening in the first place? So the idea was if we can get our King County Council, which includes the Port of Seattle, to ban any of these um, uh, fossil fuel or frack projects uh, from entering into our jurisdiction, then we effectively stop those projects from happening. So this was the launch of that campaign. And we actually got, uh, finally got the yes vote on that about two weeks ago. So we can go to the next one. Um, this one is actually probably what I'm most, uh, one of the uh, projects I'm most um, kind of proud of. And um, in that uh, we, we also really need to develop a uh, new leadership, um, our next kind of generation of leaders. Uh, what you're seeing here is a place called Lichtied Springs or Lichten Springs. It is the last remaining uh, sacred site in um, uh, the kind of Seattle area of the Duwamish and other uh, uh, Coast Salish tribes that uh, kind of uh, spring you see that's uh, an iron oxide spring that um, during a certain time of the year uh, it makes the, uh, uh, the uh, it's like a clay substance that our Coast Salish relatives will use for paint, for red paint in their uh, wintertime ceremonies. And this is the uh, last place that hasn't been uh, pavement over or desecrated or destroyed uh, where they can still go and collect um, this medicine. So several uh, uh, Duwamish um, folks and uh, other in, uh, elders in uh, surrounding tribes, Muckleshoot, Snoqualmie, and Tulalip reached out and said, you know, madam, you're kind of good with those politics things. Can you help us with protections of this site? Uh, this site is in North Seattle, which is a heavily urban area. And um, similar to that last campaign, we wanted to see what we could do to stop it from, you know, a condo being put on it, you know. Uh, can, can we get a sort of protection of it before any of these uh, developments? 
And so I said yes, uh, not knowing how difficult it is to engage in historic preservation uh, campaign, which was totally a language I didn't understand. Um, I, I drafted something up, sent it to the city, and they sent it back saying, nice start, but, and a whole checklist of things that, to be totally honest, I didn't even understand what any of them meant. I put that project on a shelf for probably about a good two years. And then um, uh, on the left side here in the green coat is uh, Sarah, Sarah Wilson, who's uh, from Pine Ridge, but runs a youth program here in a native youth program in Seattle. So I reached out to her because uh, her youth group meets actually up in this area. And I just said, you know, what about um, us giving these skills to these young people so they know how to do this so if we're gone um they they can carry it on they'll have the expertise and the knowledge uh to run campaigns themselves so this was a multi-year campaign where we worked with uh most of these youth here in addition to several others and elders from uh the surrounding tribes uh to get historic preservation for for this site uh, in which we were we won that um, last year, but I say most proud because it actually was uh, you know passing these skills on to to our young folks who um, felt very empowered you know like wow we have the ability to to impact change. I probably went over my time, so I'll I'll, I'll wrap up there. I know it's my last picture too, um, but thank you, Pu. Thank you all. Wopi Latanka. Thank you so much, Jolene and Matt, both. Um, I do have a couple of um, follow-up questions that I'm going to ask, and certainly if anyone um, in the um, participants wants to ask something, but I'll, I'll start with Jolene so Matt can rest his mind for a moment. So Jolene, you mentioned that um, I really like the, ba the bag analogy. I remember years ago someone telling me, I was in a uh, like having a lot of stress in my, uh, the workplace, and my assistant said, "Well, you know, it's because people are coming in, and they're taking everything out of their bag and putting it in yours." And it was like a really like very good visual image. So I love the bag. You mentioned um, you know positive self talk or having conversations with others that are positive, but can you give some other strategies that you think? Mm -hmm. bring joy into people's lives yes definitely so you know one of the things uh, one of the blessings of the pandemic and there are many blessings if we if we pause long enough to look but one of the blessings is is that of time right so we all our time is different depending on our work schedules and things like that but we have time to even look around in our homes and um, declutter as an example so one of the one of the lasting impacts of trauma is um, is chaos being being a chaos junkie and that that comes out in many different ways right including um, you know the the kinds of things that we keep in our in our homes you know stacks of magazines from the 1970s you know stacks of clothes because we're going to fit them one day or you know like all that kind of stuff like that yeah. that just like creates that chaos in our own space so that could be another tool is like decluttering you know re-gifting upcycling like give give things away that other people you know can use so that that's a strategy um, taking a look at the things that we listen to, you know, um, whether it be the news, whether it be music, and is that uplifting or does it, does it stress us out? Like sometimes I need, like at the beginning of the pandemic, I was trying to keep up on stuff and be aware. And then that became weighing on me. So I had to just shut off the news sometimes, right? Quit reading stuff on the pandemic or whatever, just giving myself that mental break from it. And then I think other tools also include taking a look and being aware of our physical well being, our mental well being, our emotional well being, and our spiritual well being, and doing things that are gonna make us feel good in each of those things. So maybe, um, we're gonna we're gonna start meditating maybe we're gonna we're gonna um set aside a specific place and space in our home to pray 
and we're gonna make that a regular part of our daily routine. Like th things like that, um, that can help us to bring more joy and happiness into our life. Thank you, those are good advice. I also um, have encouraged people to um, like take up some kind of um, craft or art or writing even, different kinds of things that you can do uh, or spending time with your children or grandchildren. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the craft thing. I was thinking of that earlier because when we get rid of the, the baggage or the, the clutter that we hold on to um, and we make space for joy and happiness, what, what naturally happens is our creative, our creativity increases. You know, and I, I love Matt's presentation because what I was thinking of when I was looking at his pictures is like, you can tell he has done his own healing work because mm -hmm. he has this creative mind to think of the solutions to move things forward, right? When we just stay in chaos, like it's hard to be proactive. It's hard to be positive. It's hard to be productive. So when we clear that stuff out, it makes room for creativity. Um, so we can try things like, painting or beading, writing, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I think those are really good, good ideas. Unless you're someone like me who makes those a new project. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, 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 yeah. So Matt, I was really struck by the coalition building that you do, the relationship building. So could you give advice to, you know, um, our students or others who will listen to this about what are some of the things that you look for in building relationships and that, um, you know, have kind of the productive kinds of outcomes that you want, because clearly your le leadership role is important, but you, you know, just obviously build a lot of uh, coalition and relationships. So give us some advice about that. Oh, absolutely. And then I'll, I'll tie that in. I saw the a Q and A that I, I had a, a similar question around building relationships with uh, city leaders. Cool. Um, so, coalition building, um, and I'll and I'll use an, an example with that is uh, when we launched the uh, Wells Fargo uh, campaign. I mean, we know we're taking on a Wall Street bank, and so uh, they have a lot of power and a and a lot of influence. And so we wanted to develop a very broad-based uh, coalition uh, to, uh, to run that particular campaign. Uh, the first group we actually reached out to was uh, in Seattle at that time. There was a group of uh, mostly African-American youth and other youth of color who were fighting to stop a, um, a new uh, like youth jail from being built. Mm -hmm. The city was going to spend multi-million to build this youth jail. And so we actually reached out to them first for kind of two reasons. One, um, there was an obvious link and tie to Wells Fargo. Uh, they were financing, they were one of the banks financing the construction of that jail. Uh, and then two, uh, we saw uh, that youth jail as just a different pipeline. And I know folks in education hear a lot about that kind of uh, uh, school to prison pipeline. And so uh, that's the kind of language that we used um, in bringing them in. And um, in the, the second group we reached out to on that campaign, uh, just south of Seattle uh, is, I think the region's largest immigrant detention center, ICE detention center. Um, there's a lot of folks from uh, Mexico and our, our relatives from South who are up. Washington's a huge agricultural state. <clears throat> so a lot of folks have uh, migrated up here to do that seasonal work. Mm -hmm. And, um, but a, there's a lot of energy uh, to shut that detention center down. So again, um, similar to uh, the youth, uh, we reached out to them it, with the obvious connection that uh, Wells Fargo is also one of the financial backers of uh, this particular uh, detention center. So uh, we wanted to draw these uh, parallels and links. Uh, we knew that it wasn't enough to motivate everybody to uh, join our campaign um, simply because Wells Fargo is one of the banks behind the code access pipeline. 
certainly that's our motivation. A lot of the native folks and the tribes out here, that was our motivation, but uh, it's naive to assume that that's gonna motivate everybody else. So it's our jobs, our job as organizers to see uh, those parallels, make those links and build uh, a stronger coalition. So when we crafted um, that divestment uh, uh, ordinance, um, we called it socially, socially responsible banking ordinance. And what our long-term goal was, was to craft a piece of legislation that would essentially prevent any bank from ha getting a city of Seattle contract who uh, was engaged in giving funds to either fracking, tar sands, pipelines. But then we also included language in there like, uh, are you financing immigrant detention centers? Are you financing mm. private prisons and stuff like that? So that brought in a pretty broad uh, coalition of folks to uh, oppose it. And that just, you know, is going to influence even some policymakers who maybe they could care less about the Dakota Access Pipeline because that's way the heck over in the Northern Plains. But here's a, a youth jail in Seattle that they might be opposed to. You know, or maybe they're very passionate about, you know, uh, immigrant right issues. So it was able to build a, a strong coalition. And so I'm a big believer in that, you know, we can come together on various issues, support each other. And if the coalition breaks apart from there, that's fine too. You know, um, everybody's again, has their own passion. What's interesting with that particular one is, um, I heard you mention you, one of your next uh, uh, series is on uh, defunding police. And a lot of that language that you see uh, comes directly from the divestment work that uh, folks started in, in Standing Rock. Divest from pipelines, reinvest into our communities. Now it's defund police and reinvest into our communities. And the, some of those folks we work with on that campaign, they're now leading that work in Seattle to get the city to divest from the police and reinvest predominantly into uh, black communities. Um, the one question uh, also on relationships had to do with uh, city leaders. Uh, the, the short answer is it, took, it takes a long time, um, but having that persistence and uh, kind of your own uh, kind of staying true to your, your values, you know, I think um, you can, can eventually win those uh, elected of folks over. Uh, so just real quickly, uh, in 2000, uh, actually before 2014, we had tried pushing the state of Washington to pass an Indigenous Peoples Day and replace a Columbus mm -hmm. Day for a long time, and we just couldn't get anywhere. Until uh, 2014, we got, um, I reached out to uh, City Council Member Shama Sawant, who was newly elected, and so, well, we're not getting any luck on the state level. What about Seattle? Like maybe we'll have better luck. Nobody in Seattle City Council, as progressive as Seattle is, responded to me for years until this person was elected. And she actually emailed me back within hours of uh, the request and uh, said, yeah, I'll, I'll sponsor that if you write it up. Um, which was new to me, you know, and this is something I now I'm trying to pass to younger folks. I, I didn't know that's how laws and regulations work. Like we actually have the power and ability to write resolutions and ordinances and stuff. I, you know, that was new to me. Um, but that relationship started there and we invited her and brought her into kind of the, the native community. You know, she, she came down to canoe journey. She came down to uh, the Duwamish Longhouse, so she got really active and involved, and that just built a relationship, mm -hmm. a much stronger relationship over the years, to where you can get to the point where it really becomes as easy as just texting them. You know, with, with that Green New Deal, we just passed a, uh, an amendment a couple of weeks ago to actually finance our Green New Deal, and it really was just a text at that point. Hey, you guys forgot to uh, include funding for a Green New Deal in there to uh, get the city away from uh, 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 fracking and stuff. Sorry, Matt. L yeah, let's get together and work on that. So be real persistent with your relationships and that eventually will come. And you can run your own candidates too. You know, so um, mm -hmm. Seattle is very yeah. uh, <laughs> forth uh, leading on that angle. Yeah. I see, Matt, that you had another question directed um, at you. Maybe you could answer um, through the chat. 
I'd like to uh, close with um, Jolene offering, uh, and I think it actually might even be somewhat related to the question that was asked of Matt, like what do you do when the, the uh, people that you're trying to work with aren't healthy themselves or aren't participating in a positive way in the work that's getting done? Or, and the, the question for Matt was, well, somebody who might try to co-opt your agenda. But I think what I'd like is for Jolene to close us off by talking about how do you be a healthy person in an environment where there are you know power struggles or in the case of a, of a lot of people you don't have enough resources or you know there's uh, substance abuse you know what's your kind of advice mm -hmm. for someone to practice um, self-care and, and take care of yourselves and your your vision in that space yeah great question um that's in part why I love the title of this talk today, Fighting Oppression Through Direct Action and Living a Life of Joy. And what I was getting at with that internal revolution and doing our own internal work too, is that when we don't do our own internal work, then, then it comes out as lateral oppression, right? And that's kind of in part what you're talking about is when we, when we look to keep our own people down and um, we fight over resources and we have this scarcity mentality. And when that, that scarcity mentality, um, the flip side of that is an abundance-based mentality, right? That's, that's the way our ancestors were, was they, they had that abundance-based mentality. But what trauma does, it makes us, you know, the chronic negativity and you know all of that so the more we learn about trauma and the more we understand that healing is the answer to trauma and the more that we work on our own personal healing then we're going to see the world in a very different way we're going to see the world through our trauma and healing lens so that when we see the chaos when we experience the chronic negativity we're not going to take it personal and we're going to allow it to hit us and then to bounce right off we're not going to have our bags and take all their stuff and stuff it into our bags to make it heavier. That's why I love talking about trauma because you have to talk about healing. And the more that we can all get on the same page, I'm talking about as, as tribal people, um, we're going to understand oppression and we're going to understand lateral oppression and we're going to understand that healing you know that healing is the answer so when we have our trauma and healing lens on we're not going to take things personal we're going to under better understand other people's behavior which then is going to allow us to have more compassion and kindness and even forgiveness towards them thank you i think that that's really a a good way to close because i think some of the like i said some of what the inquiries of Matt were really about how to manage relationships and take care of yourself in that space. I really believe that as Indigenous peoples, we have a, a, a benefit that, you know, many others don't have and that we do have values that we can call upon. And I always, um, you, you know, compassion, well, generosity is a value to me. Yes. That if I can be generous, I will be generous. And so I'm gonna um, go divest myself of some of the clutter in my house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Jelaine and Matt, thank you so much. This is a really great discussion. Um, I think you might enjoy the next discussion um, where we're gonna talk really about um, what does it mean to um, divest or invest in law enforcement and indigenous communities because in our reservation communities, we need more resources to support the um, safety of people. And um, so I think people have a lot of questions about what does that look like and how do you do that? So I'm really excited that we'll be able to talk about that. And I encourage you to, to consider joining us um, as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you.